This year's commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act provides us with a valuable opportunity to reflect on the progress we've made so far, while also renewing our commitment to removing barriers that would prevent all Michiganders from leading lives lived to the fullest potential. Improving accessibility for people with disabilities is an important part of my administration's continuing work to foster inclusion for all people across Michigan. It's hard to imagine having equity and inclusion without accessibility. With the development of helpful amenities like track chairs, all access canoe and kayak launches and boardwalks, we've been able to provide greater outdoor recreation opportunities for people of all abilities. But there's more work to do. Recreation can and should be part of everyone's lives. And Michigan's great public spaces should be welcoming to all. In commemorating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I invite all Michigan residents to join me in working hard to help make the path forward easier for everyone to navigate. People of all abilities can enjoy Michigan's wealth of natural and cultural resources. Find accessible recreation at state parks, hunting areas, trails, beaches, kayak launches, fishing piers, historic sites, and more. No matter the time of year, you'll find inclusive opportunities all over the state. Visit michigan.gov slash DNR accessibility and learn how everyone can enjoy Michigan's outdoors. Hello, my name is Mike Holsinger. I'm the Facilities Operations and Support Section Manager in the Finance and Operations Division of the DNR. I'm also the ADA coordinator for the department. The Department of Natural Resources is committed to accessible use and enjoyment of the state's natural and cultural resources for current and future generations. Providing greater access to outdoor recreation in Michigan is key to increasing meaningful participation for the people of all abilities. An internal accessibility team was created in the late 1990s to provide broad representation across divisions within the department, as well as a venue to discuss programs, new construction or alterations, legislation, policy and procedures. In 2007, the Department Accessibility Advisory Council, the AAC, was created. The council is an external body of consisting of private citizens who demonstrate a clear interest in improving accessibility to Michigan's national resources. They provide guidance to the department and outreach to the public. In recognition of the 30 year anniversary of the ADA, you will hear from other accessibility team members reflecting on their division's accomplishments and direction, as well as several members of the DNR's Accessibility Advisory Council. Please enjoy the presentation. Hello, my name is Alexis Hermes and I am the diversity equity and inclusion officer for the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I'm incredibly excited and honored to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act with you today. As the DEI officer, I serve on and as the executive sponsor for DNR's accessibility team and the diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice team or BIJ team. Our commitment to DEIJ focuses on ensuring that those who benefit from the mission of the DNR are considered at all levels. Our goal is to incorporate this work in everything that we do, as it is essential to truly becoming an inclusive agency, a space where all people have a voice and an opportunity. Today, we're highlighting the importance of ensuring our public spaces and recreational opportunities are inclusive for all people, no matter one's ability. The DNR provides many opportunity for accessible recreation. There is accessible beaches with walkways and beach chairs for access, accessible fishing piers, campgrounds and lodging, hunting blinds, kayak launches, shooting ranges with accessibility features, accessible boardwalks, viewing locations and trails, and even track chairs to help navigate them. So I won't get too far of uh, today's presentation as those who are coming after me will share a lot more in depth about what I previously mentioned. 
I sincerely value the opportunity to share our department's DEIJ efforts with you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angie Herrera. I am a property analyst with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, assigned to the Minerals Management Section. I am honored to serve as the chair on the Accessibility Team, otherwise known as the A-Team. The A-Team was created in the late 1990s, shortly after passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as the ADA. The A-Team provides a broad representation across all divisions within the, in the department. The A-Team is partnered with the Accessibility Advisory Council, AAC, the State ADA Coordinator, Michigan Operation Freedom Outdoors, disability advocacy organizations, and several other agencies all around Michigan in order to provide guidance and consultation to assist the department's outreach efforts. The commitment of the A-Team and the department as a whole is to continue to offer a comprehensive and consistent approach to inclusiveness so opportunities are inherently accessible to people of all abilities. But more than anything, the ultimate goal is to ensure accessibility to all who reside in or visit the great state of Michigan. Okay, my name is David Hopp. I work for the Marketing Outreach Division and currently I am the DNR's Accessibility Team Co-Chair. I would like to show an example of our work. Posted at our offices is this flyer. And uh, I will read what is on the flyer. It states that assistance is available. Excellent customer service is our top priority. We are happy to provide assistance upon request. Our staff can and will direct you to accessible areas and clear pathways, provide a pen and paper for communicating with us, speak clearly and directly, help with lifting or reaching items, read or clarify any brochures, postings, or other materials for you, guide you to the area you're headed, provide other reasonable accommodations, and we welcome service animals. Then at the very bottom, we have our DNR logo, QR code, and our uh, uh, address, michigan.gov slash DNR accessibility. So this will be posted in all DNR facilities to assist in visually welcoming people into our buildings to let them know we will accommodate them. 20 to 25% of our population have one or more disabilities and some of these customers may have an assumption that they can no longer participate in outdoor activities. This is not true. This flyer can be a conversation starter that leads to a path of re-engagement and return to the outdoors. It will also serve as a reminder to employees that not all disabilities are visible and that some customers may not want to reveal their disability. By following the guidelines set forth, we can ensure our customers will have the best opportunity for an enjoyable experience. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Scott Norris. I am currently the chair of the DNR Accessibility Advisory Council. And the council is made up of Michigan citizens that are approved by the director of the DNR. And these are people that have uh, a great interest in the, the Michigan outdoors and making them accessible. The functions of the committee are twofold. One, to advise the Department of National Resources on the um, planning, development, and management of the outdoors to accommodate people of all abilities. And number two, to educate the public and to educate local entities on how accessibility can make the wilderness or outdoor activities accessible to everyone. And some of the things that uh, we've done, um, we've advised on, on different uh, walking trails. We've advised the uh, uh, department on some of the different uh, resource venues for people to come and see different uh, wildlife uh, activities. Uh, 
We had a tour of Belle Isle a number of years ago and uh, provided some input on things that uh, could be done on Belle Isle to increase accessibility. This is after the state took it over. Uh, I've been on the committee now for, well, almost since its inception, and it's been a very rewarding experience. Um, I think that, that too often people with disabilities get stuck into a pigeonhole and people think, oh, they can't do that because this person can't see, such as myself, or is a chair user like Brian. And, you know, why would, why would Brian want to go fishing? And um, one of our other um, uh, committee, uh, committee members is uh, Neil McKenzie, who has a hearing disability. And people might say, well, why does Neil want to be out in the woods? He can't hear anything. Well, all of us want to be there because we enjoy it, just like anybody else. Um, I was... Um, uh, getting my watch and my wallet off my dresser this morning uh, in preparation to come to work. I, I'm a supervisor at the Braille and Talking Book Library, and we are part of the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity. Um, <clears throat> our parent agency is the Bureau of Services for Blind Persons. And um, while I was picking up my wallet, Underneath it was sitting my uh, new 2020 hunting license. So for the last uh, six years, um, I've become a deer hunter. And I started off with a crossbow. And um, one of the other folks that works at the library with my wife on the fifth floor is a fellow by the name of Joe Hamlin. And Joe and I came up with a system uh, homegrown system, just like uh, some of the things that Ken Buckholtz is doing up in the UP. And we have some hand signals that we use. So Joe puts his hand on my back. We're sitting next to each other. And if he wants me to move the bow up or down, he moves his hand up or down on my back uh, or left or right. And then if it's time to shoot, he just squeezes. And so in 2018, I got my first deer with a bow. Then my uh, Joe and my brother-in-law, who hunts a lot, um, he just returned from Alaska where he was successful. But anyway, Joe and Brett were after me to uh, go into uh, gun hunting. And uh, so that's what we're going to tackle this year. We've got a, um, I've got a Ruger 450 and we have a, um, a laser mounted on top of the scope. So, um, you know, I enjoy the outdoors just as much as anybody else. Uh, last week, I spent several days up at Nuego State Park uh, camping. It was great because there weren't a lot of people around, so it was quiet. Um, but I'd like to encourage anybody that has a disability to explore the outdoors, whether it's canoeing, kayaking, fishing, uh, just wandering around on a trail. Um, you can contact me at the Braille and Talking Book Library. My desk phone is 517-284-2871. My email is N is in November, O-R-R-I-S, S5. That's Norris S5 at Michigan.gov. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Kristen Wildman, and I am a public land matters biologist for the Department of Natural Resources Wildlife Division. I work with wildlife biologists in the field um, to help them address land administration issues on state game areas and state wildlife areas. Such issues might include land acquisition, disposal, easements, and land use permitting and allowable use. So 
in addition to my regular job, I am also a representative on the DNR accessibility team for the Wildlife Division. I'm a representative along with my colleague, Ryan Suyard, and I have been a member of the accessibility team or A team uh, for almost two years. I personally have a hearing disability and um, I have worked in the past on a lot of accessibility projects um, down in southern Michigan at Sharonville State Game Area and other game areas as well. For a lot of us, being a hunter is part of our identity. It's who we are. And if you can't participate in hunting, um, a lot of people would feel like, who am I without this? And we don't want people to feel that way. We want to make sure that if you're a person who wants to participate in wildlife related recreation, like hunting, trapping, and wildlife viewing, that you are able to do so. And that you have that part of yourself um, with you and you can participate um, as you would like. And so, we have a lot of opportunities and options for people with disabilities to participate in hunting and wildlife viewing on state land and across the state. The best resource we have is our website, www.michigan.gov slash DNR accessibility. If you visit that website, you'll see all kinds of information specific to um, hunting, shooting ranges, and track chairs. All three of those, I think, are extremely helpful in helping you to plan how to participate in hunting and wildlife viewing or whatever wildlife-related recreation you're interested in. They have a lot of accessible blinds that are available um, on a variety of state parks and recreation areas. And several state game and wildlife areas have accessible hunting features as well. I encourage people to visit that site um, more than just once because it's always changing. We're always doing new projects. We're always adding opportunities. And so if you visit that site, you'll be able to see all of the different um, state lands that have these kinds of features that you can either reserve or you can call the um, land manager about them to get more information. We also have um, special hunting opportunities for individuals who qualify. There are special hunts and special um, opportunities, for example, the Sharonville State Game Area has a Pierce Road unit that has special hunts on it. That's an opportunity as well. A list of all of those opportunities, again, is available on that website. We work with partners such as the uh, uh, Michigan Operation Freedom Outdoors to help people get out and do what they want to do. And so there are resources to work with our partners um, as well as our staff to make sure that if there's something you want to do, let's see how we can help you get it done. Um, in addition to blinds such as ground blinds, hydraulic lift, elevated blinds, um, and then even accessible pads where you can put your own pop-up blind. Um, we might have other opportunities to help you as well, get the kind of access that you need. Um, we also uh, have track chairs available at select state parks and recreation areas. So if you want to um, try out a track chair and that's an accommodation you need, it's a great resource. Um, I've seen them in action and um, they really are amazing. So another thing to remember from a state land perspective, um, track chairs are not considered a vehicle. And so you can use your track chair effectively um, wherever 
you want to walk um, on appropriate terrain for that, that piece of equipment. And so that's important to remember that if you have that kind of adaptive equipment, um, you know, you are welcome to use it. Um, we also have a number of shooting ranges with accessible features statewide. I encourage you to look at that. We're constantly updating um, our amenities at shooting ranges. And so if you're interested in sighting in your firearm or um, working on your archery shooting, we have those opportunities as well. I think that the most important thing we want to remind people is that our goal is to reduce any kind of barriers to your participation in hunting and wildlife related recreation. So you can always contact the land manager for a state game area, state park, state wildlife area, and just talk to them. Let them know what you want to do, what kind of things are keeping you from doing it. Maybe there's something we can do to help. Our website at michigan.gov slash DNR accessibility under hunting also lists a number of permits that are available to people depending on what your needs are and your qualifications are. There might be a permit that's right for you to allow you to participate in an activity in a certain way on state land. Our staff are extremely willing to sit down and help people access land and participate in hunting and wildlife related recreation. It's very important to us that if you want to do this activity, we wanna make sure you can. And so our job is to make sure that you can participate in hunting and wildlife related recreation. And while we can also balance that with the protection and conservation of wildlife habitat and resources and the quality of the area use. And so if you think that there's a certain spot you want to go hunt, you can take a look at our website and we have a list of all the game areas in the state. And if you go ahead and select one of those game areas that you're interested in visiting, it will give you the information and a map for the headquarters um, contact. So you can always contact the area manager and just talk with them. There might be a land use permit that you might require for the kind of use that you're asking for, but those are all things that we can do. We can do tailored, um, tailored permits for the kind of use that you require if that's what you need to participate in hunting. And in other cases, you might be certainly satisfied with the amenities that we already have set up that just require a reservation or a visit to an area. So with that, I would just like to reiterate that hunting and wildlife viewing and all wildlife related recreation is for everybody of our state and people of all abilities. And we're here to help. Thank you so much. Okay, now um, my name is Ken Buckholz and I'm part of the National Wild Turkey Federation. We are the Basinock Gobblers chapter in Upper Michigan, Escanaba. And we started a program back, oh, 20 years ago or so to help people with disabilities get in the great outdoors called Wheel and Sportsman. Um, we, we started off, we did uh, target shooting, we did some pheasant hunts, and we always had a, a problem with people with uh, less mobility to be able to uh, handle a firearm or uh, be able to do a, like the pheasant shooting and, and so on. So we, we started working and brainstorming to come up with, a, with, with some kind of an idea or some kind of equipment that would handle a firearm and then be able for the person to be able to pull the trigger in a safe way. And it was just, uh, it, was, it was pretty tough. We built some homemade equipment and stuff that it worked a little bit, worked okay. We, we harvested a few deer and, and so on. But then about 10 years ago, we met up with a, a company called Be Adaptive Equipment out of uh, Indiana. And this guy come up with a, a unit, it, it, uh, he outfits wheelchairs with it. 
there's a pan that's about 15 inches that goes under the under the seat of the wheelchair. And then there's a like a one inch pipe that comes up. It's a unit that's called a HQ100. It's a high quad unit that uh, the firearm goes into. And there's a camera that goes on the scope. And then there's a monitor that sits on, on top of the uh, scope. And there's a joystick that the person can use their chin to move the joystick back and forth and up and down. And then they can see on the screen on the, on the three inch monitor that they have on there where they're at. And then next, right next to it, there's a little short hose sticking out for the sip and puff. And the sip and puff trigger actuator works by a person puffing in just like taking a drink out of a straw. It opens a, a vacuum switch, puts power to the trigger assembly and fires, fires the gun or crossbow or whatever you have in it. And you know, it works really, really slick. And uh, we checked out the equipment and stuff and uh, said, you know, we need to get this stuff so it's mobile and be able to get out and uh, maybe build some trailers and some blinds and stuff. So we did, we actually got together with the intermediate school district and worked with the kids. And uh, we uh, built, a, built a blind. And uh, so mounting, for mounting the equipment, instead of putting it on a wheelchair, we built a table. We took that pan that's 15 inches. And uh, what we did is we built a table about 30 inches high that basically takes the place of the wheelchair. And we mounted the equipment on there. And then we put a battery in there because all this stuff runs on 12 volt batteries. And we also put solar panels to keep our batteries charged up. And uh, so the equipment would go on there. And what we did is we put a longer hose on it. So if we had a person that was, say, a maybe a quadriplegic in a wheelchair that uh, had hardly any mobility at all. We could put that, that, that hose right to, their, right to their mouth, to their lips to puff in on. And what we did, instead of a three inch monitor, we have a 15 inch and our new blinds now have 19 inch monitors that mount above the window that we're normally hunting out of. And uh, it, works, it works really, really good. There's a joystick. We have a joystick that's on a, it's on a longer cord instead of like the one on the other one on the wheelchair. And uh, so either they, if they have enough mobility, they can use the joystick to zero in on the target, whether we're target shooting or hunting. And uh, you look up on the monitor, and you can see where the crosshairs are. And the monitor, you know, put your crosshairs where you wanna, where you wanna uh, hit and puff in on that hose and it fires the gun and it's very accurate. Uh, nothing moves and uh, we got great, great accuracy with it. And, uh, so anyway, we, we, uh, so we accomplished our goals there and we built the first unit and um, it worked out great. And we had other, other people that wanted to help us out. So we decided to build a trailer. So anyways, we put a, put a trailer together. Everything was homemade and uh, done with donations and stuff. So what we did in the trailer is uh, basically the same thing as our blind. We put a, a, a cable mount unit in there and put the equipment in there and we, we could go mobile with it course with our solar panels to keep our batteries charged up and we've had opportunities to go to different landowners places and uh, be able to hunt and uh, be successful and uh, our program started expanding we started getting more and more people um, that wanted to get out and uh, so we uh, expanded and built a couple more blinds and as of now we have three trailers mobile trailers and we have uh, five other blinds that are eight by eight built out of uh, cedar. And they have the nice, the floors treated lumber, rubber roofs on them. And that's what it works out really, really good. And uh, we, uh, we were an all volunteer program. It costs nothing to go out hunting with us. And if you can't afford to, to have your game processed, we will do it for you. And uh, it, it, it's been it's been a lot of a lot of fun, that's for sure. And uh, uh, it's just uh, it's been it's been a good time. We've been helping other people. We go out uh, turkey hunting. We go out uh, deer hunting, and we we go out bear hunting. Matter of fact, right now we're working with a young lady that is disabled and uh, trying to get her a her a bear. And uh, it really opens the doors and gives people opportunities to get back out and enjoy the great outdoors because, you know, there's, there's nothing better than that. And uh, if we can help anybody, you know, please contact me and, and uh, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll help anybody that we, that we can to get out and do this, this sort of stuff. Like we just went through the Liberty Hunt um, 
here on the 12th and 13th of uh, September. Uh, we took out about eight or nine hunters and we harvested uh, six nice bucks and, and a couple does too. And uh, it was a lot of fun and a lot of joy. And uh, so anyways, that's what uh, our, our program is, is, is just doing great. Right now we're getting set up for the independence hunt and uh, we're looking forward to uh, get more people out in the, in the great outdoors. So um, if we can help anybody, um, please get a hold of me. And uh, we, I got on, ended up getting on the on accessibility council because it's a, a good fit for what we, we both do, trying to help people get back out in the great outdoors. And it has been a, a lot of fun, that's for sure. So, so anyways, uh, we can help anybody, please uh, get in touch with me and uh, we'll see what we can do for you. Uh, my phone number is area code 906-553-2268. Or my email is kwbuck, B-U-C-K, at icloud.com. And uh, contact me if you'd like some help and want to get back out in the great outdoors. Thank you. Okay. Hello there. My name is Neil McKenzie. And what an honor it is to be on this DNR board. This is great. This is a great example of the deaf community and equal accessibility for such things. And for the month of September, we've done something new called Liberty Weekend. And that's deaf hunting with, with rifle season. And that's five days before the actual beginning of September. And also in October, in the middle of October, they will be allowing the deaf to be able to use the bows and arrow for hunting as well. And I'm trying to think of what else. Give me just a moment, if you will. If any of you would like to get any information or reference to deaf accessibility, please check out the DNR um, bio. And also you can contact me directly. And my email is is N V E T T E one nine nine six. And that is at gmail.com. Or you can go ahead and give me a call 810-412-0341. And I can share everything that I have in reference to that. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay. My name is Tom Jones. I'm the president and CEO of Michigan Operation Freedom Outdoors. I'm also a combat veteran of the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, in 2006, I was hit by a roadside bomb in Iraq and sustained a traumatic brain injury um, amongst other uh, invisible wounds, as they call them. And on my journeys through advocating and reintegrating um, back into the civilian world, I noticed a lot was lacking with... Uh, you know, outdoor recreation and the, uh, a steadfast approach to make sure that everybody gets outdoors. Um, as public, you know, Michigan residents, we have access to nearly 5 million acres of land. And it doesn't uh, decipher whether you can walk out there or not. It's ours as the public residents. So kind of like what Scott was saying, you know, it's, uh, I said, why would Neil want to get out of way? It's for nobody to, uh, question or, or judge besides that individual. And as a council, we make sure that that's included. Um, anything that comes across the desk, uh, the council sits down and we make sure that we don't have to go back through those three or four years later when somebody complains that it's not accessible. So what I do with Michigan Operation Freedom Outdoors is I expand accessible opportunities for anybody with a health challenge. Um, disabled veterans are coming home with a tough reintegration and I'm a firm believer in nature is a great healer. Um, <clears throat> we have individuals that you know come to us that have fallen out of tree stands or have never been able to recognized as an outdoorsman or woman because of the um, accessible limitations. So 
I have started a project where I have a dozen accessible um, wildlife viewing slash hunting blinds within the Sharonville State Game Area. And it's caught on really well. The um, amount of people we're getting out into the outdoors, in my mind, is making up for the difference in the um, able-bodied hunters that we're losing. Every year you hear about uh, numbers declining, but also every year you hear about us expanding these opportunities. So it goes hand in hand um, with our council and my mission and Ken's mission and Brian's mission, everybody on the council kind of has a one team, one fight approach to make sure that accessibility is included in every one of these um, building proposals or activities. And it's very important, especially this day and age. Uh, like I said, you know, nature uh, being in the outdoors is a very healing um, environment. And it takes sometimes people to get out there to really realize their potential. And we just stand by to help. So I'm going around the state of Michigan and I want to continue to place these accessible wildlife viewing blinds for anybody to use, whether you want to hunt with a Remington or borrow Scott's 450 Bushmaster, or if you want to shoot with a camera, it's not up to me or anyone on the council mm -hmm. to, um, kind of detour somebody away from doing what they want to do in the outdoors. It's free the public. It's uh, free for anybody to go out and do exactly what they want. Um, a little bit of willingness and volunteers, and it goes a long way. And you never know when you're going to change somebody's life. I mean, this is a very rewarding um, organization. It's very rewarding to sit around the table uh, with the Accessibility Advisory Council, and just to hear the approach that we're now taking to this, I am a firm believer that we are uh, we're we're on our way. And with so many advocates, and um, you know, with it being so easy to contact us, I encourage people to be their own advocates and tell their local biologists what they want to see and, you know, call the state and include, you know, reach out to every one of us because we're a, a big network of resources that can really help some folks. So I would like to extend my contact in case anybody wants to um, get around. You know, we have track wheelchairs that are accessible into the blinds. Uh, so we get people taking themselves out, you know, from 200 yards to a half a mile into the woods. And these machines are so beneficial for folks that I've bought four of them just to give them away. And I've gotten with the adaptive housing department uh, with the veteran affairs for older generations and younger generations to uh, be able to have these chairs and get that quality of life back. Um, again, my name is Tom Jones. You can email me at tjones.miofo at gmail.com, or you can look onto our website, www.miofo.org, and there's a Suggest Your Adventure link. And I would love to hear from folks, um, you know, to see a lot of emphasis is on whitetail deer hunting right now. we got open day archery tomorrow, and I have 12 individuals um, that are very much looking forward to this. So uh, I want to continue to be able to do this. I want to continue to be able to communicate with my council members um, to give people answers. You can contact me at myofo.org or at tjones.myofo at gmail.com. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cindy Burkauer, and I am now on the DNR Accessibility Advisory Council. Like Scott, I've been on the council since its inception, served as its chair a number of times over the years. And the council actually was formed as a part of our Access to Recreation Initiative with the Kellogg Foundation, and that was an initiative that I um, developed and 
led for about five years for the Kellogg Foundation. I'm gonna to talk to you just about a couple of really cool, awesome, very unique experiences that we have here in Michigan that are inclusive as well as universally accessible. And the difference between being ADA compliant and inclusive and universally accessible is really important. All of our things that are compliant with the ADA, if people say, I'm gonna make it ADA compliant, that means that they've made it as legally as hard as you're, they're allowed to make it from an accessibility standpoint, because the ADA is a minimum standard. So DNR has embraced through our Access to Recreation initiative years ago and going forward, this concept of making sure that things are inclusive and universally accessible. That means we go above and beyond the minimum requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two opportunities that really embody this concept of inclusive universal design that are part of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources um, State Parks and Parks projects. One is Akiak Falls. It is the only universally accessible waterfall in waterfall experience available anywhere in the world. We developed this project with three different ways to get from the arrival point, from the accessible parking, through the accessible picnic area, actually to the waterfall experience. And it's why people come there. They wanna get in the water, in the waterfalls, have the water flow over them, be able to go up and down the waterfall shelves as the water pours down. It's a really cool and unique experience. So in this project, we created three different ways to get down into the water. One is starts at way at the top with climbing rocks, essentially, and there each rock is positioned so that it becomes a transfer. So you can leave an assistive device at the top of the hill, scoot over on a rock, and then butt bump, as we call it, down about four inches onto another very cool, smooth rock, and then scoot over and change directions and butt bump down all the way down to the water and out actually into the waterfall on these rock transfers. The second way we devise to go down is for somebody who's using walker, crutches, um, has some balance issues that might need some assistance going down and we have very big, flat, wide flagstone steps that would accommodate two people side by side and somebody who's using an assistive device, all of that fits on the rock. You step down four inches with your walker, or your crutches, an assistive device kind of thing, or a person helping you. They're huge spaces, and it is a ser series of these stairs going down to the water and actually out into the water. And the third level is we have a completely universally accessible walkway that takes you all the way down to the water. It's a beautiful walkway through the woods, and when you get to the bottom is a stone transfer to help you into the water. So this is a unique project and it accommodates people who want a variety of challenges. All of the amenities at the Akiak Falls also are universally accessible. Picnic tables, grills, every walkway, the bathrooms, everything. So an awesome opportunity. There is a um, video on our website, on the DNR accessibility website that shows you the accessibility features of Akiak Falls. I encourage you to watch that. There's a young man who shows us how all of the um, accessibility features work for him to get into the waterfall. And he's a very cool kid to watch do this. The second project I wanna to talk to you about is one that has been evolving over years. Um, it is another one of our access to recreation projects with the Kellogg Foundation, and that's the Muskegon State Park Winter Sports Park. And we developed an accessible year-round luge experience, a summer luge and a winter luge experience at the sports park. One is a roller luge, and you can go up a ramp transfer right onto the luge sled, go all the way down, transfer out of the sled, back into your assistive device. And there's a complete route that closes that loop for you to do that as independently as you can. Um, we also have the ice luge. It is actually was um, an Olympic training center luge. 
Likewise, we have transport up to the middle part of the luge. There's an accessible yurt up there where you can view the luge from there. And then there's accessible transport up to the top of the luge so that you actually can luge if you are somebody with a disability. And we have transport built into this design to get you to the top. That design is in process. The building of that is in process. The other thing that was developed this summer is an inclusive, universally accessible zip line canopy tour through the dunes at that same location, utilizing that same transport system up to the top. Then you get into the um, zip line harness, you come all the way back down to the bottom, and there's a way for you to exit at the end and get back to an assistive device. There again, a completely closed loop of transport to move person as well as assistive device. Michigan is absolutely on the forefront of creative, inclusive, universal design projects in the out of doors. Very unique things. The DNR has uh, really embraced this challenge to do better than the minimum of ADA requirements, to do the maximum we can for universal design, for inclusive design, so that we all have the same opportunity to get outdoors, enjoy our nature, because we are the Great Lakes State. And we have tons of water opportunities. You've heard about kayaking and fishing and boating and all of the woods and um, hiking and hunting, all those kind of things. So great opportunities. And the thing that's so important about the council, the Accessibility Advance Advisory Council, is we're the group that helps advise the DNR and come up with some of these really creative ideas and say, hey, how about if you do this instead of this? We also hold them to task to say, if you are going to spend money on developing new things, spend money on grants, don't give grants to people that aren't going to make it inclusive and universally accessible. That's a part of the grant criteria. So this council has done a lot over the years to really guide and nurture the development of inclusive, accessible outdoor recreation for everyone. And I encourage everybody to visit the DNR website. You've heard that before. Um, volunteer to serve on our council if you're interested. But most importantly, get your family, your friends, get outdoors and experience these wonderful accessible outdoor opportunities. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jordan Bilek with the Michigan DNR Parks and Recreation Division. Uh, my position is the Waterways Development Program Manager within the Parks and Recreation Division, and I wanted to talk a little bit and show a talk a little bit about our State Park and Recreation Facility Accessibility uh, Improvements, Initiatives, and uh, the like. I want to begin with some of our projects. Uh, Barragut State Park uh, in the Western UP. Uh, Great project there that we completed uh, in the last few years. We added 14 full hookup campsites and uh, improvements included the addition of accessible campsites. In general, when we redevelop campsites, we consider upgrades for accessibility nearby at adjacent campsites. So it goes beyond just the, the original scope. Um, moving into another facility, we've completed some improvements. This is at Leelanau State Park. This is a playground structure. Uh, in the picture here, you'll see uh, the structure where we have ramps that provide access to various elevated components. And we have a green uh, poured in place rubber surfacing that allows for mobility devices to easily access the uh, different ground components. This project was actually a partnership between the uh, Michigan Cares for Tourism, Friends of Leelanau State Park, and the Michigan DNR. And for several years, the uh, Parks and Recreation Division has had funding provided as a match for groups who want to raise funding for new playground equipment. And the DNR match covers the cost of the rubberized surface, whether it be a port in place or a large tile type of a surface with a value typically around $50,000. Moving on to some other improvements that we've done. This is at Rifle River Recreation Area. This is a trail system and boardwalk. You'll see the photo on the left there is a, a gravel surface trail with some uh, railing and uh, uh, other uh, components there. And on the right is a trail at the uh, recreation area uh, where we had to uh, basically traverse some areas where we had to have a somewhat of an elevated boardwalk, a lumber boardwalk there. 
and both trails are, are really great uh, opportunities to kind of get out there, get outdoors, get into some unique areas uh, through and around the trees. Port Crescent State Park is another uh, great facility. This is just another uh, example of a boardwalk that we put in. Uh, this has the uh, kind of the strip along the base there, uh, which helps as far as keeping any wheeled uh, types of uh, vehicles or uh, uh, mechanisms uh, on the path and uh, uh, provides connection between some different park elements there uh, across kind of a sandy and uh, tree-lined landscape. Taquamanon Falls State Park. Uh, we've all heard th about this park. This is an overlook, actually, this photo here, a new overlook that was constructed out of timber at the Lower Falls area that you'll see in the background. Uh, in addition the board, to the boardwalk, um, he, there, I'm sorry, in addition, the boardwalk along the Lower Falls was also improved so it meets uh, the ADA accessibility. Staying in the UP to the west is the McLean State Park. And uh, in this picture, you'll see we have an accessible pathway that goes all the way to the beach. Uh, this did not previously exist, so it's a really a great, uh, great opportunity for our users to get right out onto the beach. Uh, and another great thing about this is we constructed it to be wide enough to, for emergency vehicles to access the beach, creating a quicker response time. Staying at McLean State Park, this is uh, basically a transfer platform at the beach. Uh, this helps individuals using mobi mobility devices to transfer in and out. Moving down to Ludington State Park, this is a major development project that we accomplished a number of years ago, uh, an elevated boardwalk along the river there, uh, as you'll see in the photo on the left. And then on the right, which is kind of unique, it was basically a ramp uh, with railing that uh, provides direct access right to the water, uh, you know, fishermen enjoy using it because you can pretty much go right into the water and go out and do some fishing in the river and stuff like that. But it really provides a great opportunity to, to access right down to the water there. We have our Palms Book State Park, kind of towards the central and eastern upper peninsula. Um, this is actually home to one of Michigan's greatest natural attractions. It's a kitchen at a teepee and uh, it, at 200 feet across and approximately 40 feet deep, it's actually Michigan's largest freshwater spring. And so some of the photos right there really provide some, some great views of uh, what that raft looks like sitting on the water, uh, how folks can access that, ramp, that raft through some uh, ramps and things like that. And then the lower left corner kind of gives you a, a view of what it's like on the raft. So you have kind of multiple views, whether you want to look out from the raft into the springs, or there's even a viewing opportunity to look down in, in the middle, and uh, be able to see down under the water through down into that 40 foot depth of uh, really pristine water. It's a really cool place to go. I re recommend that place for anyone. Crystal Lake boating access site. So I just wanted to try to highlight, you know, how we incorporate access at our, at our waterways facility. So this is Crystal Lake Boating Access Site. Uh, you'll see actually in the foreground on the top picture, we have a trail uh, that actually bisected the site. It's kind of a, a biking pedestrian trail, uh, fully accessible through there that we had to uh, try to connect some different opportunities there along a rail trail. And then towards the background, it may be a little hard to see, but we have our typical uh, uh, parking area, accessible parking, uh, accessible uh, vault toilet facility, with an accessible path out to uh, an approximately 80 foot long floating courtesy pier. And that's what the bottom right picture there is, is this floating courtesy pier. And what's nice about this is it's a it's a nice and long, so it really provides a great way for folks staging to get on and off boats. The other thing too is it's a floating pier. We all know water levels can fluctuate. Um, so this basically floats along with the water level. It's not a fixed structure where you might have one day a really big gap between the water and the deck surface and another day it's uh, you know, closer. This this really uh, um, um, adapts to the, the varying levels of water. So it's a great thing out there at Crystal Lake uh, Boating Access Site. Interlochen State Park, here's another cool thing that was uh, developed. This is a kayak launch. Um, actually, this was, and you'll see the picture there, the kayak launch. It's the system. It's, I believe this might be like an easy dock type of system. 
and you uh, basically transfer yourself down into this this channel kind of area, a mechanical channel that allows you to basically roll down um, this grade into the water. Um, and this is actually something that was developed at our first state park as uh, part of the centennial celebration we celebrated recently. Uh, this kayak launch helps visitors of all abilities to enter and exit the kayak uh, on a stable surface. And there is, in addition to this accessible parking, an accessible route that leads to the launch. And in fact, this is a project that was actually completed by our own internal DNR construction crews. And we have a number of these uh, type of uh, mechanisms at different parks around the state. So they get a lot of great use and a great opportunity, especially with the uh, the, the ballooning really of our, of our paddle sport industry over the last you know 10 or so years. We're seeing a lot more people using canoes and kayaks and paddle boards and things like that. So this is a great opportunity to, to get out there uh, with those types of uh, watercraft. I want to talk a little bit about our toilet shower buildings. So we did create a standardized design in Parks and Recreation Division uh, with the goals of energy efficiency, low cost, low maintenance, obviously accessible. And the other thing too is uh, family bathrooms. So the family bathroom was implemented with accessibility in mind. It provides a single user bathroom to allow for families to go in with their kids, um, to allow for helpers and spouses to help elderly use the restroom and to provide a really a safe gender neutral space for all users. Uh, in addition to that, we have two accessible showers provided. We're actually only one is required. We went to two. So uh, that's our toilet shower building. In addition, and I have some photos there of the toilet shower building um, interior. So you're in the foreground, you have the sink area in the background, you have the stalls with the accessible stall there. And on the other picture is more of an exterior view of our toilet shower building. Um, it was, uh, this style has been incorporated or is being incorporated into 11 recent and upcoming buildings. Some of those include uh, Straight State Park, Fayette, Pinckney Recreation Area, Wilderness, and McLean State Parks. And we've got a couple others coming soon, Wilson State Park and Muskegon State Park. Moving down into the kind of the, the water access beach areas, uh, here's a picture of a uh, a method that the DNR uses. It's a variety, one of a, many methods that we use to help people access a shoreline. Uh, you, this is using a hardened material. Um, and we also have others that are like roll out beach mats that basically provide a stable surface for folks to get right out there into this, onto the sand, into the water. Uh, 20 of our parks actually provide beach access similar to what you see in the picture here. This is a pretty cool uh, program um, where uh, we have a device here. It's a Moby chair. Uh, this is at Interlochen State Park. And you'll see in the one picture, kind of a blow up of the chair there. It's a three wheeled chair with uh, basically a floating, a floating type of setup. It's got floating mechanisms. And you'll see right there the example of a couple of assistants helping an individual out there in the water. And really for this person, it was, it was really his first time in the water since an accident that he uh, was in several years before. And was something he really thought wasn't possible anymore since he had to rely on his wheelchair for mobility. So this was a really cool way for uh, using something like this, a device like this to get right out and get right in the water, lay right back and uh, really give you a, a sense of uh, um, being kind of within the experience instead of kind of enjoying it from you know, the side, so. Uh, another uh, device out there that we have at some of our facilities is a track chair, uh, which is a, a really versatile uh, type of system. It helps visitors explore areas of the parks uh, where traditional wheelchairs may not get into. Uh, these off-road electronic chairs can easily handle trails, snow, sand, and even water up to eight inches in depth. Uh, the pictures here on the left is uh, on the beach at Muskegon State Park and individuals enjoying that experience. And then on the right, we have uh, some folks uh, heading down a trail at Tequamanon Falls State Park. The facilities these are located at, we have them at a number of different places around the state. They are available on a first come first serve basis at no cost. And typically the way that these have been funded, they have come through donations from friends groups, as well as uh, working with an organization called Cali's Cure. So that's a track there. I want to just 
touch on a little bit of the access to recreation program. This is a program, a, really a partnership program that uh, Parks and Recreation Division uh, got involved in a number of years ago. This is to basically improve accessibility at our recreational facilities. Uh, partners include W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Midwest Community Foundation Ventures, Michigan Recreation and Parks Association, and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. So some of the projects that we've completed utilizing uh, this program and, and assistance are at Brighton Recreation Area, Dodge 4 State Park, Muskegon State Park, at Siegel Lake State Park, Port Crescent State Park, and Wells State Park. And you'll see the photos there of a couple of examples of access to recreation projects. One on the right is an overlook looking out over uh, the Great Lakes there. And then in the bottom is again, one of those like easy dock uh, kayak canoe launch uh, systems. So in 2014, uh, the Lighthouse Neurological Rehabilitation Center partnered with Interlochen State Park to offer an adaptive cycling clinic. This has grown into offering three adaptive cycling clinics and three adaptive paddling clinics each summer. These are offered at no charge for individuals to get out and try new outdoor recreational activities. Uh, they have therapists and volunteers on hand to make adaptations and modifications to all the different types of equipment, you know, could be cycling, kayaks, stand up paddle boards with a goal of increasing enjoyment and independence while enjoying the park and the park experience. So Interlochen State Park's been really uh, going, going, uh, going really well on uh, some of these adaptive programs. Um, just some other photos uh, to give you some examples. Uh, right there, they basically took a stand-up paddleboard uh, so that someone in a, a, in a wheelchair could uh, utilize that by basically adding some kind of buoyancy balancing mechanisms, like in this case, they've got some piping, looks like some PVC piping. The other picture is just simply like a two person kayak where they've added some balancing, some, some buoyancy mechanisms there as well uh, with an assistant there too, to again, get some folks out and really enjoy the outdoors and the, in this case, the water. Um, the park has been able to add a Brock Talk, Moby Chair and Easy Launch through these programs. And, uh, Partnerships have really been formed to make this program successful, including training equipment from Central Michigan University and equi assistance and equipment from local businesses. Uh, through these programs, the park has been able to increase awareness of the need for accessible recreation opportunities and push for further upgrades in this area. Last thing I really wanted to kind of talk about here was uh, an accessibility checklist. This is something that the Parks and Recreation Division began a couple of years ago. Uh, and it's really just a tool to assess the various infrastructure found in our facilities for compliance with uh, standards, codes, and guidelines. And so it's a, it's a more simplified approach uh, set up in a way that really allows anyone to, to use regardless of their knowledge of the ADA requirements. So it's, it's uh, something that's still in process and finalizing, but it's really just a, uh, um, something that creates more efficiencies for our, how our folks can assess their facilities. That's all I got, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jordan Bilick, and you'll see my email there is B-Y-E-L-I-C-H-J at michigan.gov. Uh, Mike Evanoff, I've also looped him in here as a contact, E-V-A-N-O-F-F-M at michigan.gov. And he's got a phone number, 989-233-8615. Mike and I are both uh, on the accessibility team for the DNR. Mike is kind of the lead, and I'm kind of his backup but I uh, thought it important to provide our contact information if, if you have any more questions about some of the information that we've provided here today. And again, thank you and uh, enjoy your day. So my name is Cleo Harris. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and I work out of the Lake Erie Management Unit and that's in Southeast Michigan. Um, I'm uh, not part of the A team, but I was asked to give this presentation um, just because we do have quite a few fishing opportunities in Southeast Michigan and you know, pretty much across the state. Um, we are really fortunate in Michigan that you know, we have uh, over 11,000 lakes, over 36,000 miles of rivers and streams, and about 43% of the Great Lakes actually are in uh, Michigan's border. So there's a lot of water out there. 
Um, and fortunately, we have you know, great colleagues like in Parks Division and Wildlife Division, as well as other um, uh, collaborators and municipalities and things like that that provide a ton of access points. And so from Fisheries Division, um, we manage those waters that are then provided access points. So, um, you know, we don't get the chance to to uh, directly work on those action on those uh, um, piers and things like that. But, you know, we do have world class fisheries like walleye in the Detroit River, which you can see on the, the left picture here, or in uh, you know salmon runs out the Big Sable River that you can see at Ludington State Park in the um, picture in the middle. And then even simple fisheries like our bluegill and bass fisheries that you can access from piers on local lakes. So there's quite a few opportunities. And one way that we manage those opportunities is uh, through stocking. Um, that's a, a big management tool for us. And if I can advance my slide. Um, and to set up stocking, we actually have to rear the fish to, to provide those opportunities. And one way we do that is through our hatchery system. And uh, we have a hatcheries like our Wolf Lake hatchery uh, that has vis visitor centers that offer uh, universally accessible tours uh, of that facility. So the interested people can go see different life stages of fish as well as um, how those operations function and how we actually get fish out to lakes for people to, to uh, enjoy. And uh, another, so that's, uh, Another thing that we, you know, one way that we get fish to those hatcheries is by uh, getting wild, getting uh, eggs and spawn from wild fish at the weirs. And you can see in the bottom pictures on the left, there's a steelhead. And, um, you know, that's at our little manistee weir. And so we, what we do for a weir is um, we kind of stop the flow of fish up the stream, as you can see on the bottom right picture. And those fish then are kind of forced to go upstream into uh, through some uh, fish ladders or race into a raceway where we can get the adults and then get the gametes from them, fertile, have those eggs fertilized and transfer that back to our hatcheries. And uh, the Little Manistee is another location where we offer um, tours and there's universally accessible tours and uh, portions of the weir um, where uh, you know, access is, is optimal for people. So you can see how that operation works as well. And um, through, you know, with all these different opportunities, um, you know, because there's, there's quite a few and I, you know, wouldn't even try to name off a bunch here. We do have a, a lot of like electronic resources that are available as well, such as our trout trails that if you're interested in trout fishing gives a, a lot of different locations and these are um, sites that are identified by fisheries division personnel. There's also um, things like the family friendly fishing waters. And that, uh, that is information that's provided by anglers where, you know, they provide access, you know, what the accessibility uh, capabilities are at a site, what amenities are available. Um, so that's great information to share and also what species they catch too. Um, another program that we have that gives you some spatial information is our MyFish or Michigan Fishing Information System. And this is an ArcGIS platform that we can, you know, will give you some maps and show you where different facilities are like our, our hatcheries or lakes or streams, just so you can see what's available in your area. And it ties in a lot of information that we collect. Another one that's not housed by fisheries division, but our parks division um, is the, um, Mr. Biz or Michigan Recreational Boating Information System. And this provides a lot of detailed information about the uh, boat access sites um, across the state with, you know, what amenities are available and what kind of access is available there as well. And, you know, I, I urge people to, you know, one of the best resources is our local fishery staff. Um, our contact information is on, uh, on our website at michigan.gov backslash DNR. Um, we, uh, we're also, we have the, our contact to the customer service centers in the uh, fishing guide each year. And, you know, if, whether you're talking to someone at a hatchery or someone in one of our management unit offices, we're all really passionate about fishing. And, you know, we would 
gladly help anybody out. And we, you know, we actually look forward to those contacts and then hearing how you do as well. Um, so I've included my email address at the bottom of this. My name is Cleo Harris again, and my email address is H-A-R-R-I-S-C-9 at Michigan.gov. So that's at M-I-C-H-I-G-A-N.gov. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Brian. Wilkinson, that's B-R-Y-A-N-W-I-L-K-I-N-S-O-N. And I was born and raised in the small town of Sheboygan, Michigan, up near Mackinac City, uh, just a short ways down the road, US 23 from Mackinac City. Um, growing up in town, I lived about three blocks from the Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac. So that was the icebreaker Mackinac. And then I also lived maybe two or three blocks from the State Street Bridge in Sheboygan where the DNR office is. So I spent a lot of time fishing right there at the dock at the DNR office. And I also spent a lot of time um, on the fishing pier uh, that, that uh, where the Sheboygan River actually flows out into Lake Huron. Um, most more recently, uh, I, I was able to fish with Michigan Operation Freedom Outdoors uh, with, a, with a bow. So that's something that, uh, that I took up uh, when I, when I, um, got a little bit older as I took up archery and, uh, and I enjoy bow fishing. But to kind of back up a little bit, uh, I was paralyzed when I was 19 in a dirt bike accident. And so I'm a spinal cord injury. I have, uh, I'm paralyzed from the thoracic five, which is chest level down. And so I'm unable to move my legs um, and I don't have any function below the chest level. So I use a wheelchair from point A to point B and uh, it's just really a piece of uh, equipment that, that gets me around and uh, allows me to be mobile. Otherwise, I'm probably just as active or more active today than I was even as a kid being able to fish in my hometown of Sheboygan. So I currently reside in Brighton, Michigan, where I just started uh, actually a new business called Michigan Track Chair. And I'm, uh, I am the new Michigan Track Chair uh, representative for the whole state. And we have a uh, piece of equipment that can go on your track chair. It's a fishing rod holder. And so when we're talking about the fishing piers and the parks and the docks and the uh, ramp systems and, um, and even some of those sidewalks that go out to the water, the track chair, um, as it was mentioned earlier, is a very nice piece of device or equipment that you can actually get a lot closer and more intimate with your fishing if you'd like to. So if you like fly fishing, the track chairs can actually take you right down into a stream bed. Um, and uh, as long as you don't go eight inches, uh, you're typically pretty safe. So as I got a little bit older, uh, as a kid, my parents bought a farm between uh, the farm that my dad grew up on between Mullet Lake and Burt Lake. So I was about four miles between those two inland lakes. And so I got to do quite a bit more fishing um, on those inland lakes. Uh, and the accessibility um, after I was paralyzed has just been great having the docks that go down into the water and, uh, and having those uh, kayak launches. I wanted to briefly kind of touch on that a little bit too because I think um, the kayak fishing is something that's kind of uh, picked up and um, there is through the DNR a marine exemption certificate for folks who have disabilities um, that physically might not be able to get to certain locations in the water. Um, there is an electric motor uh, certificate that you can do, I think, with, your, with a kayak. Um, don't quote me. You might want to check with the DNR uh, specifically, but, um, but this certificate will allow you to get into some places that you might not be able to otherwise. I uh, also growing up in Northern Michigan, I got to visit the Odin Fish Hatchery. And with the Accessibility Advisory Council, I was also able to visit the Platte River Fish Hatchery. And both are really incredible places. And I highly recommend a person with a disability uh, to visit those. They are accessible and it's a neat experience to be able to, um, to do. So, uh, tw you know, I'm 20 years post-injury and I've just got a wealth of experience 
a wealth of knowledge. I'm really connected with the um, disability sports community. And so if you guys need to get a hold of me in any way, shape or form, please contact me through my new business, track chair, uh, Michigan track chair dot com or you can call me at 616 the number two the word tracks and that's 616-287-2257 or you can email me at wilkinsb that's w-i-l-k-i-n-s-b at michigan track chair.com thank you hi i'm Lori burford i work in the michigan department of natural resources finance and operations division I am the DNR's statewide range specialist, and I am responsible for evaluating target shooting occurrences across Michigan in order to improve access to safe and fun places to hone your archery and firearm skills. Over the past five years, the Michigan DNR has really increased our range renovation and development across the state. Many of our facilities offer paved pathways that extend from the parking areas to the firing and target lines and a few even offer modern accessible restroom facilities. Accessible firearms ranges do exist in numerous state game areas in Southern Michigan. These include Allegan, Sharonville, Rose Lake, Dansville, and the Lapeer state game areas. Each of these facilities offer accessible pathways that extend from parking areas to those firing and target lines. All of our shooting lanes are accessible as well, and they're able to be used in an upright or seated position. The Rose Lake range also has accessible restrooms with running water, and it is also home to the Hallenjean Glasson Shooting Education Center. The DNR has improved ranges within some of our state park and recreation areas as well. The Algonac State Park offers a small handgun and shotgun range that's accessible. Algonac State Park is a lovely area on the east side of the state great spot to, to visit and uh, enjoy that small handgun range and lovely campground they have at the, at the Algonac State Park. In addition, our marketing and outreach division staffs accessible ranges at Pontiac Lake and Ortonville recreation areas. They also oversee two top-notch ranges that are located within the Island Lake Recreation Area and the Bald Mountain Recreation Area. Each of these staffed ranges offer a variety of target shooting opportunities, including archery, handgun, rifle, and shotgun shooting. The new supply road range pictured here was recently completed in Northern Michigan's beautiful Grand Traverse County. This range offers an accessible vault toilet, accessible lanes and pathways that extend from the universal van parking areas and that connect all of our range features. In addition to the DNR managed ranges across the state, numerous partner facilities exist, including the recently renovated indoor range at Michigan Technological University, as well as the newly renovated Rifle Creek Archery Park in Ogama County. Both facilities offer on-site instruction, accessible lanes and access, and modern restroom facilities. We'd love to have you come visit one of these accessible shooting ranges across the state. And to get more information about these opportunities, you can visit our website at www.michigan.gov slash shooting ranges. Thanks so much. My name is Andrea Stay, and I'm a grant coordinator with the Finance and Operations Division of DNR. I represent the grants unit on the DNR accessibility team. My role is to work with Southern communities to apply and then carry out recreation grant projects. The DNR Recreations Grant Unit oversees three pots of funding, the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, and the Recreation Passport Fund. Local communities apply to these grants every year. They use these grants to acquire additional land for natural areas and parks and to develop their existing lands. Example projects include new trails, playgrounds, boat and kayak launches, restrooms, and other public amenities. Funds can also be used to renovate older equipment or buildings at a park. Across our three programs, we provide approximately 20 to $30 million in grants to cities and counties and townships each year. One of the programs, the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, in total has 
awarded over 1 billion in grants to local units of government and state agencies for projects throughout all 83 Michigan counties. These grants are very competitive and make a dramatic impact across the state. These funds exist to enhance public spaces so that people of all abilities can enjoy them. Accessible design is a priority for the DNR and for these grant programs. About 15 years ago, we added accessibility as a scoring measure for the applications that came in. We provide a clear scoring criteria that communities use to prepare their application and design their project. Because of the competition for these grants, every point counts. We ask communities to consider the accessibility of their project in two ways. One, we review what a community wants to put on the ground. What specifically are they building and how accessible is it? Second, we look at the connection to the members and organizations that support people with disabilities. To do this, we give credit to those applications that have had their project reviewed by someone with a disability or an organization or advocate for people with disabilities. On one of my recent projects in my area, I read a letter from a local mom whose child had a neuromuscular disorder. The mom had reviewed the plan. She found a lot of things she liked about it, but she asked the city to add a swing that would support someone like her child that needed more core support. The city happily made that change so that their playground would fit this family. All projects need to meet basic ADA guidelines. That's the law. But additional points are available to those that go above and beyond towards universal design. There are points available on a sliding scale for some, a majority, or all of their project. We also review each plan for accessible parking and access pathways to each of the items to be developed. Maybe not every community can do everything for accessibility, but we encourage them to do some and take a step forward, something like widening those access pathways. It doesn't have to be overwhelming and costly. There are options that fit every community and cost does not need to be a barrier to accomplishing universal design. Many of our projects are older equipment that was installed before the current ADA rules and needs to be replaced. In reviewing historical applications that were funded from 2014 to 2018, we found that communities were making changes and being more accessible in their parks. About three quarters of all of the projects funded included that design review from a person with a disability or an organization or advocate for people with disabilities. Just over half of the funded projects incorporated some design elements that went beyond ADA to universal access. And depending on the funding program, between 25% to 40% committed their entire project to meeting universal design standards. Sometimes as we work with a community and provide them their preliminary score, they alter the design to be more accessible so that they can have a better chance of securing the grant. Through universal design, all people have a shared experience. They use the same equipment and fish off the same pavilion together. An access pathway or a Mobi mat may help someone with mobility challenges move down past the sand. And it also helps the parents pushing a stroller. These are inclusive so that everyone can have the same recreation experience and people of all abilities can have access to the same quality of natural resources. We are excited about the partnerships at the state and local level that make these grant projects happen. We're even more excited about the experiences that are created for families and individuals. Our grants unit helps communities throughout Michigan provide recreation for everyone. From visiting a playground to riding on a bike trail, these grants create opportunities for experiences that people will always remember. If you want to learn more about funding for your community parks, please visit www.michigan.gov backslash DNR grants. Thank you. My name is Justin Lippy, and I'm with the Michigan Recreation and Park Association, or M Parks, and we're a, a member-driven organization uh, for the recreation profession in the state of Michigan. And many of our members um, have been the recipients of DNR uh, grants, and we're just so grateful for this um, for this program and for this opportunity. And the um, the ADA is just a wonderful piece of legislation, and we're so happy to celebrate that here with this uh, presentation today. So we're, we're just so excited with um, the role that the ADA has played in, in the importance of these grant projects. And um, it's really been neat to see at the state, local, and county level uh, the, the various projects that have been impacted um, 
through accessibility. And that we have, um, this has really been statewide. We have areas all throughout the state in Grand Traverse County, Berrien County, Fruitport, Eaton County, Oakland County, Flat Rock, Belle Isle. And, and what's happened through all these different projects is that um, it, just as Andrea had explained the importance that um, the ADA component has scored through these grants, this has allowed for campground improvements. Um, it's in, included for access to these recreation facilities, uh, parking, trail access, playgrounds, splash pads, kayak launches, and, and restroom facilities. And so it's only enhanced uh, the opportunity and access for these recreation amenities throughout our state. And what a great uh, thing that's been happening these last 30 years of the ADA program. And to think that each year we're just getting better and better and provide, continuing to provide more access for people with disabilities to these recreation opportunities throughout our state. And it's just, a, it's just a great thing that the DNR and the Natural Resources Trust Fund has, has put together with these different funding programs and how we can continue to provide accessible recreation throughout the state of Michigan. We're just so happy to be a part of that and happy to be um, an important partner um, in this program. Thank you. Hello, my name is Billy Vickers. I work with the DNR Advisory Council. Um, I've been here for almost a year and I'm proud to say I'm part of this council. Um, almost 20 years now, I was involved in a motorcycle accident which left me paralyzed from the T6 thoracic level down. Um, my life has been a whirlwind ever since. I was involved in hunting and fishing very actively before my accident. Um, and obviously after my accident, I wanted to pursue those activities as well. Um, being a paraplegic, I look at things a little bit differently. I look at things through the lens of accessibility and access. That could mean wheelchair access, accessible restrooms, paved walkways, accessible parking and other accommodations. The state of Michigan and the DNR has done a great job and they've gone to great lengths to compile a very comprehensive list in directory. For those of us who don't own hundreds or thousands of private acres, we need to realize we still own a portion of the outdoors in the state of Michigan, the state parks. Getting outdoors again and being reunited with nature for people with disabilities is made possible through integration and accessibility. The state of Michigan and the DNR has gone to great lengths to make it possible to ensure everyone of all abilities can enjoy our great state. We have lots of opportunities, even more resources. So there's no reason why we can't get back to the outdoors to truly enjoy our great state. Hello, my name is Mike Holsinger. I'm the Facilities Operation and Support Section Manager in the Finance and Operations Division of the DNR. I'm also the ADA Coordinator for the department. During their presentations, many times the DNR accessible page has been um, uh, talked about. And on that page, you will find a series of nine different buttons you can push from beaches, cabins and lodges, camping, fishing, hunting, kayak launches, accessible trails and scenic sites, track chairs and shooting rings. When you click on the, the button, it will tell you exactly where those opportunities for any of these um, accessible recreation opportunities exist. Good afternoon. This is Dan Eichinger, Director of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. At the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, we understand that our beautiful state forests, parks, and waterways should be welcoming and enjoyed by all, including people with disabilities. We've marked some great successes so far in improving access to recreation and cultural opportunities throughout our state, and we will continue to work for more. We want to learn and discover more ways that we can help make Michigan accessible to everyone. We at the DNR want to spread the word about the improvements we have made so that more people across Michigan, regardless of ability, can enjoy outdoor recreation as part of their everyday lives. 
On behalf of the DNR, happy 30th anniversary ADA. Thank you.